Hi, this is Jamin Hageman, and this is The Service Design Show. Hi, I'm Mark Fontaine. Welcome to your two weekly service design update, where you get to learn what some of the world's best service designers are currently doing. We talk about the current state of the industry, exciting new developments, and the challenges up ahead. The Service Design Show is all about helping you to become a better service designer so you can make a bigger impact on the world around us. We bring you a new episode every two weeks on Thursday. So, subscribe and make sure you don't miss any of the episodes. Every comment, like and share really helps to grow the community. So, don't underestimate your influence and click that like button down below. It really means a lot. My guest in this episode is Jamin Hedgeman. Jamin is the head of design at Capital One Financial Services and he's part of the Service Design Network management team. In his spare time, he plays soccer and brews beer. For the next 30 minutes or so, we'll be talking about topics like giving service design away, doing service design in-house and the need for a compelling vision. If you want to fast forward to one of these topics, check out the episode guide down below in the description or stick around and enjoy the whole episode. For now, let's jump right in. Welcome to the show, Jamin. Thank you. Jamin, you've been part of the service design community for so long. I, I still remember the first service design conference we met in Amsterdam back in 2008, something like that. Um, yeah, it, it was quite a long time ago and we had the opportunity to talk again uh, back in October, again in Amsterdam. But I'm really curious, uh, what I don't know is what was the very first time you actually uh, got in touch with service design? The, the first time was actually my first week of graduate school at Carnegie Mellon University. I, I had never heard of service design, and I, uh, but I started grad school and at the, uh, Shelley Evanton was the sure. graduate uh, professor at, at, at Carnegie Mellon, and she had created a conference, uh, a service design conference. And it was taking place the very first week of my, my graduate school experience. So I got to go and got to uh, see people like Birgit Mager and Oliver King and Chris Downs and, uh, you know, just really opened, opened me up to a world that I didn't know it existed. Mm -hmm. Uh, but since then, I have uh, the the conference after that I directed, and uh, since then I've I've actually put hosted a service design conference or been involved in one uh, every year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you go back quite a long time, and Shelley is I think now doing head of service design thing at Fjord, right, or Accenture. Yeah, she, she, I forget exactly what her title is, but she teaches, um, or she's running like a service design academy within, within Fjord. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, good that you're on the show, Jamin. I'm uh, curious what we'll uh, be talking about. So, um, I have a few topics that we can talk about and you have a few question starters and, uh, let me just pick the very first one and I'll do them in a random order. So to surprise you, right? Great. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. This one. Uh, let's let's start with this one. This is a very positive topic, and it's a topic of giving away. Do you have a question starter that goes along with that one? And can you hold it up? I would say <laughs> my my wild card right away. But uh, what does that mean? What does giving away mean? Um, help us out. Yeah. So. Uh, that, that was actually inspired by some conversations that I had with Todd Wilkins, uh, who just spoke at uh, the Service Experience Conference, gave a keynote talk. And he he and I were talking about having a conversation like this uh, before uh, figuring out if he, he would be a good speaker for the Service Experience Conference. And he had worked at IBM and was part of uh, that whole movement uh, going on within IBM to bring mm -hmm. design in and build up that capability. And, uh, 
you know, he found himself in more and more situations where he had to, he, he could not be involved in everything. And he had to uh, essentially start giving away design, giving away service design and uh, hoping that the, the people that he was giving it away to uh, would, would care for it and, and, uh, and do well. And I find myself in the same situation. Um, but when I talked to him about this, I, it, it made me very uncomfortable and it was, I felt like it, it hit a, a nerve for me, but also within the, the service design community around um, how much we own service design and the expertise versus being collaborative and open and teaching other people and empowering them to do some of the things that we do, recognizing that not everybody is going to be, you know, an expert, mm. probably, but they need to start somewhere. And there's so much work to do that holding on to it completely ourselves is probably not the right answer. So we have to start giving it away more. Well, and it's interesting because when you talk to people who enter the service design community, they are always like, wow, this is such an open community. It's so collaborative, but um, you're, and you're still saying that we are holding on to it too much. It's too dear for us. Uh, well, it's, it, you know, in, in a way it's our, it's our baby. Uh -huh. and, and you, I mean, for myself, I put so much time and effort into the practice into the community and um and yeah i think in our in our action and, and uh, in our design work and what you do as a service designer you kind of are naturally collaborative and and empowering others but it can get a little bit touchy when other people say uh oh yeah i'm a service designer too and and you think well but you just went to a workshop yeah yeah and yeah now and uh, yeah, somebody recently said a, a service designer's worst, worst nightmare is is somebody saying, uh, "Yeah, I'm a service designer. I just I just learned about it last week." And, well, and, well, I think it brings up a good question about you know the skills and the craft of service design versus the mindset and participation. Mm. Um, but we also need to especially for those of us who are, who have been around for a while and have built up a level of expertise, uh, just be comfortable with, um, you know, people who are uh, just coming into it and starting out and, you know, taking their first baby steps. Well, yeah, that was one of my biggest insights from the uh, conference uh, in Amsterdam that sometimes it's easy to forget that, for, for instance, we got a 10 year head start. We started back in 2007 and y you don't always realize that there are new people coming in every day to their, to their field and they are having the same discussions we were having eight years ago, right? So that, that's easy to, I'd say that's easy to forget. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious what will be needed in your, uh, uh, in your perspective to share more and democratize service design more next to feeling comfortable with the fact that people call themselves service designer? Is there anything we can do to speed up the process? I think, what can we do to speed up? Oh, well, it's interesting that you use the word democratize service design because that is the, the language that we're using within uh, my division of Capital One. Um, and, and that's really something that I've been asked to do as head of design is how do we, how do we democratize design? They don't, you know, they're not a, a place where they would come directly and say, Hey, bring service design. But as, uh, the, the advantage I have is top level, uh, support for that kind of scaling and, uh, If you can get that, I mean, that, that's that's been the, the big challenge for for design. Um, but uh, if you can get that, that's that's great. Uh, if not, I mean, what we're really doing to at least experiment with this is find some 
teams to to start and uh, and see how it goes. So uh, I've been introducing service design tools to operations teams, people who really don't interact much with at all, actually, with our design teams, um, and don't think too much about the the way they uh, um, how they're ex interacting with the customer end to end. So uh, the tools that of service design are really helpful for them, and just giving them giving them those tools and letting them experiment themselves and uh, getting them to own it, I think, is is the way to scale it fast. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's one that's one of the big questions for the coming years is how can we make how can we give people the feeling that they own it right i, I think you said it really nicely how do, how do we give others the feeling that they own it because that's that's really powerful right instead of us having to convince them and yeah and i think that's the that's the giving it away part mm -hmm. you know that you know essentially the the cadence that we started to fall into is very short uh introduction to a particular method or tool going through an actual going through the actual problem or service that uh, the team has and and i all i do and, and my design team does is help facilitate that so it might be something like oh we're going to help just show you what the current state blueprint of your service or your, or your piece of the service looks like but then once we do that on post-it notes we don't even take that with us. We just leave the room and say, this is yours. We're going to come back in a week or two after you worked with it some more and we'll see yeah. what we've got. Yeah. 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 There's no, there's no expectation that we're going to continue to work with it. So, Jamin, we, uh, we touched upon it quite a few times and let's move on to a second topic and um, um, sort of you're already talking about this, but maybe you can introduce it with a new question starter. And this topic is called in-house. Any specific thing? Why did I go in-house? Yeah, because you you left working for all sorts of fields and focus yourself, tied yourself to the financial sector. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, well some, some of it, some of this question is my choice and some of it was not necessarily but uh so i uh was part of adaptive path a a uh, design and service design consulting firm uh i had been part of adaptive path for four years before we were acquired by capital one which is a bank in the us uh about two years ago so first we moved in house uh, through that acquisition, but I decided to stay to explore some of the challenges that I felt we weren't able to get at from an outside agency, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, wanted to see if being being in house and being a strong service design team that was already built in house, essentially, uh, what that would do. Um, and I think we made a lot of a lot of good progress, but. Recently, about five months ago, I decided to take this new role as head of design for one of Capital One's divisions, financial services, which is home loans and auto loans. And I did that because I felt that while we were putting together a great system of service design and how to how all the pieces worked well together and how we collaborated, we really there was still a disconnect between what we were doing and what was happening on on our partner side and on the business side and, and the way they were thinking about innovation. And I felt like I needed to get closer to that. So that's why I made that move. And that's that's where I am now. And I feel like that's really my mission to figure out uh, how how really to, to bridge the, the gaps between what we've been doing in service design and uh, what's going on in the the product and business side. So that's of course super interesting because I think a lot of service designers struggle with the fact that they uh, 
fail to create impact in the end, we come up with a lot of insights, good research, uh, we uh, get people engaged, but we eventually fail to make that final impact. Is, is that also what you're recognized and made that move? Yeah, I mean, we, so like most, uh, like most agencies, we've had our, our share of really good work that doesn't get implemented the way that we thought or just lost steam after yeah. we disengaged. And we had clients prior to, to Capital One. Uh, I had a client for three years doing service design work. We, we did a lot of different things. We, you know, from the visioning work to mm -hmm. pilots and launching things and getting, uh, getting new experiences into market. So I, I wouldn't say that, you know, none of it gets into market, but it's a struggle. Yeah. Even with a long engagement like that, what I saw is as soon as you pull out and that pressure is not applied anymore, the organization just naturally goes back to doing the way the things the way it did. Mm -hmm. So I, I felt that the real culture change that's needed and the behavior change that's needed uh, means that you can't just do it from the outside. And I, and I think increasingly we're we're seeing this, you know, with uh, we saw it with UX with companies saying like, hey, we can't outsource this. We need to bring it in. Uh, we're starting to see service design go more in house. Think, think Capital One's. Uh, acquisition of adaptive path is it, it at least accelerated that visibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and cool. this is something else. <laughs> yeah. Well, so if you uh, you know that that's everyone who is watching and listening and uh, um, viewing the show from an agency perspective is of course curious. What is your biggest takeaway? You know, if you would leave uh, Capital One today and start a uh, and then an agency, you'll start your own new agency. What would you do differently? Is, is there something we can do differently? Or is the only way to do it also from the inside? Well, I think, I think I would probably have different conversations with my clients. Like what? <laughs> like what, what success, what is success and what are we trying to achieve? And, and I would probably have more frank frank discussions with them about what it really means to do this kind of work, what it's going to take from them, and uh, what will be successful or not. So, for example, if they're, if they're not really engaged, if they don't really have the time and commitment and they see this as a, an add-on, it's not going to, it's not going to work. It will have a short-term impact uh -huh. on the organization, but it won't have, it won't have long-term. And I, I think, Probably, I would do a mixture of project work, but also capability building for the organization, um, helping them own the work and and develop the, the capability themselves, and, and being I guess comfortable with whatever we we left them with is not going, they're not going to be expert service designers, but they need to commit to having that capability, right. not just the work. Right, right, right. Hmm, hmm. Um, anything, yeah, it's so recognizable and it's also so challenging because uh, you have to be at a very high level in your organization to have these kind of uh, the discussions, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's uh, again. I'm, I'm. I feel uh, humbled that I have access to the head of the division and the the presidents of each of the lines of business. That helps. <laughs> yeah, I, I can. I can have those direct conversations about what we need, um, but not everyone's there, huh. and so I mean, it would be a different thing if, like, we don't have that. How do How do you? Uh, how do you start? And I, and I think what, what people are, I mean, what we did in Adaptive Path and what I think what I see in the community is, is what you can do for now. Uh, you know, you engage with part of a business, you find, you find a part or you find a partner, an advocate for what you're trying to do. And, you, you know, you try to create that energy. Um, 
but it's going to be difficult to really change the way the organization works uh, in a in a very rapid way without some kind of buy-in to yes we're going to experiment with this um, and maybe that's the way to talk about it like it's not just about doing it's not just about doing the work or creating the vision and coming up with a great experience there's another component to that and that's that's building the capability and maybe framing it as a hey is there a part of your organization that we can experiment with mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it doesn't mean that your whole world's going to change but we want to see what that impact is and if that works then you can think about scaling it to, to your organization those are not the conversations that i was having before uh and that's that's what's really top of mind for me now all right um so many questions still uh, around this topic but let's move on because i think the third one will also be interesting and uh, uh your final third topic uh is about compelling vision we all need one so uh i don't know i, I might go with the wild card again again <laughs> uh what what is a compelling vision because uh, good question jamin <laughs> well i i um i wanted to talk about this because it as I am interacting more with my business partners, uh, and especially as we're going into the, the end of the year, everyone's thinking 2017 and the future and, um, and having, having a vision. I mean, that's just, that's part of the language of, uh, of organizations. And of course you're trying to rally everybody around that. For me, I have, when I say vision, I have a particular, idea in mind mm -hmm. of what that means uh, through my service design work since i think a big component of service design is storytelling and vision creation in a tangible way that other people can easily understand and align to but i don't think that that's the way vision translates into the business world uh, when when organizations talk about vision, it's usually language, uh, and even even referencing um, examples like Steve Jobs, you know, the vision was put thousand songs in your pocket. Boom, let's go there, right? So, it, and that that provides some guidance, but I think in service design, we're talking about more of an experiential vision, and and something that feels meaningful to people. And that is done through through storytelling, whether that's storyboards or videos or, or other other methods. Mm -hmm. And I, d I don't necessarily think that. I mean, I, I guess I find that that's a challenge for the larger business community to to understand the need of that. I think when they see it, they respond to it. But when when we're having this conversation about creation of a compelling vision. There's, there's something missing there. Well, I, I've, in one of the previous episodes with uh, um, Eric Flowers and Megan Miller from uh, Practical Service Design, we were talking about, uh, they mentioned, uh, once I start talking about jobs to be done, um, people get back to the uh, core essence of why we exist in a, as an organization. And I think what you're saying, the compelling vision also strongly relates to that is, a sense of purpose. Is, is, is that true? Yeah, it, I mean, it's a sense of purpose, and and it's. But I, I think for me, it's more of the articulation, mm -hmm. the vision, and and ensuring that everybody can see it and and, and knows it and believes in it. And you know, it, um, you maybe may know that at places like Airbnb, they have. Uh, their vision of the experience up on on the wall in a very open space uh they brought in pixar artists to to illustrate it and you know they map their uh touch points to that but everybody kind of sees like yeah what yeah about, yeah right? yeah it's not just this part or this thing that you're dealing with like 
we all know that this is what we're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. Is the purpose. Um, and, and so that it's, it's something that the whole organization knows this is why I'm here. We're trying to do that. It's not my little part and it's not just the words that that yeah, said, yeah, yeah. top said. Yeah. And, and, uh, <clears throat> what you're saying is that this is important in the business world. We need to find a way for them to adopt this more. Cherish it. I think. I think what we need is a. Um, what I've been finding is that there's the the business language of vision is is different from I think the service right. design language right. of vision, and and like m most of what I think needs to happen for service design is just a, a much tighter blending of the two. So I think they complement each other. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and but I think we need to find a way. It's, it's, it's almost like a language barrier thing. When I hear somebody say vision uh, in a leadership position and, and I say, hey, we need to create a vision and they say, yes, we do. I don't actually think we're saying the same thing, <laughs> but, but it's needed. And I think both sides are needed. <laughs> and uh, besides Airbnb, are there any uh, stories or companies that you know of that inspire you that, that, that you think have done this really well or is Airbnb the best example? Uh, Airbnb is probably the best example that I know of that ties directly to the way I, I guess, think about, uh, creating that vision. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot, I think a lot of companies now create, um, videos and things, but I, but I feel that the way that they, the way that they created it in their workspace so that it's visible to a large number of people and, and just part of their environment is, is what's key to, to how they did it. Huh. Because, um, you know, a lot of the artifacts or things that we make or during like video, I just said, um, might get shared around, but then it gets lost. Huh. Hmm. Especially uh, things in the computer well, hmm. to find th their way into a dark place and uh, never seen again. Well, those are the things on the computer, but I just got chills down my spine uh, by walking through companies that have their, their hallways filled with uh, stock photo images of their core values and saying we're a team and stuff like that. That's that's. That's not what we want. <laughs> Let's just to be clear. No, I think, I think, yeah, I think you want it to be more real. Yeah. Uh, more real of like what you're trying to achieve, more connected to your, your customers. Uh, hey, it'd be even great to have a vision for your employee experience mm -hmm. uh, and, and show what you're trying to achieve there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that the reason I, I brought up the compelling vision topic was just the, the, the disconnect I, I feel and um, what, what I'm not really seeing in, in organizations too much mm -hmm. to help, help drive uh, people and rally them around a purpose around this is the experience we want to create and, and then finding a way to organize around that. Right. I know what you, I think I know what you mean. Um, <laughs> Jamin, we're, we're sort of heading to the wrap up of, uh, of our talk and I have a final question and that is, um, is there a question you'd like to ask the viewers, people who are watching this episode and like to comment or anything you want to ask them? Hmm. Um. I guess, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know if this is a great question, but, uh, I, I guess I'm curious, like what people feel that they need now to, to do service design work, especially when there's a lot of the tools are out there and they're easy enough to, to kind of pick up and try yourself, but. You know, what, what are the big questions now? I mean, as somebody that, that programs conferences and, and has conversations like this with, with other 
and, and trying to find what content is going to be helpful for people. Uh, yeah, what what are the big questions in in service design now that can really help uh, people be successful? So you're asking a question back. That's interesting. <laughs> what are, what are the big questions, right? What are the big questions within service design? That's that's basically your question. Yeah. Well, I would love to know from other people. Yeah. That yeah. What they, what they think that is. Comments. Comments. Give us a lot of feedback and comments on uh, in. Uh, on this question. Jamin, thanks for making the time. Um, really happy to, to have you on the show and um, thanks for, for all your insights. This is great, my pleasure. What are your thoughts about the topics we've just discussed with Jamin? What do you consider the big questions within service design at this moment? Let us know down below in the comments. The Service Design Show is all about helping you to become a better service designer and make a bigger impact on the world around us. If you enjoyed this episode, check out some of the previous episodes. And if you haven't done that already, click that subscribe button. For now, thanks for watching and I'll see you in two weeks time.